everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad y'all could be here. I am very, very excited to be back with y'all. Uh, somebody, uh, the doctor, when I last got tested not too long ago, uh, she said, how long has it been? I said, well, I've been out of work for almost a month, so you do the math there. So, But uh, I'm really excited to be back with you. Uh, I am feeling great, feeling healthy. Uh, Lexi is feeling great. She's feeling healthy. Although, uh, do continue to pray for her just a little bit. Uh, it's not a lasting thing. She's negative. She is totally fine. Uh, but her loss of, or she's lost her sense of smell and taste. So she didn't get to enjoy the taste of a lovely Thanksgiving dinner. So that was uh, a little bit interesting. Hopefully she'll be able to get some, some Christmas dinner in her. So uh, yeah, but uh, also one quick thing I want to share with you, if y'all weren't uh, privy to seeing Facebook around yesterday, uh, we had a little uh, announcement that we put out there. And for those of you who didn't get to see it, I just want to let you know this morning, and I wish you could be here to let you know as well. But um, we found out yesterday we're having a little baby boy. So we're, uh, we're excited about that. It was great. Uh, it was a fun time. We were able to spend uh, some time yesterday with some family celebrating. So we're excited about that. Uh, so we're going to start off this morning with a song. We're going to sing This is Amazing Grace. So if y'all will stand with us as we worship and sing.
As you're seated, I want to welcome you again this morning. Congratulations to Aaron and Lexi. It's a boy, I voted wrong, but then again, a lot of my votes this year went wrong. But anyway, um, the, uh, we want to come today and just celebrate the Lord. We've had a great Thanksgiving. Did y'all have a good Thanksgiving? Amen. And uh, eat a lot, I'm sure. And uh, who still has leftovers? A few of you, okay. The rest of you know how to eat the last two days. So, uh, but today uh, also it begins, it's kind of a strange day because we're still decorated for fall and Thanksgiving, but today is also the first Sunday of Advent. So tomorrow begins the process of uh, decorating the church, but we have our Advent wreath out and we'll be uh, doing that today. So I just want to remind you that today as we light the first candle of the Advent wreath, the purpose of celebrating Advent is to help keep our eyes off the secularization of Christmas. And it does, we do get caught up in that. And to focus on what the real meaning of Christmas really is. Each week is marked by a different candle that signifies a different aspect of Advent. The four candles represent the 4,000 years since uh, before Christ's coming. The three purple candles and one rose candle. The candles represent Jesus that he came uh, to bring us, what he came to bring us. The evergreens represent life for those who are in him. And they're arranged in a circle, which is a sign of the eternality of Jesus, who has no beginning or end. He is our Alpha and Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek language. So each Sunday, we will light an additional candle. Then on Christmas Eve, we'll add the white candle, which is also known as the Christ candle, and light it to signify he has come. This morning, we light the first candle, the candle of hope. candle of hope with Christians around the world we use this light to help prepare our hearts and the minds for the coming of God's Son our Savior Jesus Christ may we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah who said in Isaiah 9 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light a light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness and we need light this year amen, amen. we need to be thinking about the light of Christ we need to be thinking about the hope we have uh, yesterday I did a funeral and talked about the hope that we have of Jesus in eternity. This coming Tuesday I'll be doing the funeral for my aunt, and uh, it's been a tough year for many of us. But God is a God of hope, and we have hope, and we have the ability to worship here today. And we're going to celebrate as we enter into the Christmas season. We'll slowly be adding Christmas songs today and throughout the coming weeks and celebrating the coming birth of Jesus. Amen? He gives us hope. I know we're all hoping for a better year next year, <laughs> but I'm also hoping for an eternity with our Savior. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We just praise you today as we look at the birth of Jesus, and we thank you that you give us that light, that you give us the hope that we will one day become lights uh, to in heaven, but we need to be a light in this dark world that needs to know about a Savior. Prepare our hearts today to receive your word. I pray for comfort that those that are mourning, help them to realize they can have hope in eternity with salvation through Jesus. I pray for that you give hope to those that are feeling depressed or discouraged, downtrodden, beaten, weary. Help us to have hope that you are a God of comfort and a God of strength. Renew us today. Help us today to realize that we can have joy through Jesus as we prepare to enter into this Advent season. We think of the coming celebration of your son. I pray that you all give us that encouragement we need and to celebrate all that we need to be celebrating. We thank you for a great Thanksgiving as it prepares us to come into a time of the anticipation of your son. We praise you now in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 While well, we slowly want to uh, incorporate some Christmas songs as we move into the Christmas season, I'm going to put a little fast forward on that. We're going to do two today. Amen. I've been waiting on Christmas music since, well, January of this year. So I'm ready to sing some. We're going to start off this uh, morning by singing Joy to the World. Get some joy in our worship this morning. Let's sing to him the first, second, last verse of Joy to the World. Joy 
song we're going to sing this morning is oh come all ye faithful and i, I want to do something get a little extra crowd participation in this morning all right so when we come to that uh that chorus it says oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore him it's in there three times so the first time that we sing oh come let us adore him i'm gonna have my ladies sing on that first line okay second time we sing it i want to have the men jump in and sing on that one and on the third we're going to bring it all in together make it nice and strong all right let's see how we do on this first verse of oh come all ye faithful Faithful. next song we're going to sing is uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and I just want to read a quick verse to you from Lamentations chapter 3. Now, if you know what the, the book of Lamenta Lamentations is, it's got the word lament in there, and the word lament is just great sorrow, anguish. They, they called the author of this book the, the weeping prophet. But in Lamentations chapter 3, the Bible says this in uh, verse 21, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, 
we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The faithfulness of the Lord, his mercies, his love, his grace, it is new every single morning. Uh, whatever happened last night, whether you were uh, getting all riled up and said some things you shouldn't have said during the football game or whether you had some conversations and said some things to a family member you shouldn't have at Thanksgiving, guess what? The grace of God is new every single morning. Great is his faithfulness. Let's sing together.
Good morning. Good morning. Um, Pastor Roderick asked me to, what I'm thankful for, and there's a lot. That's a that's a big egg to crack open sometimes. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Jack Montgomery Patterson Jr. Most of you know me as my Monty, so that way you know my full name. So if you ever go to the hospital, ask for Jack, not Monty. <laughs> so, so get that out of the way. Um, Sorry, um, um, I, was not I was not raised, brought up in a Christian home, like a lot of people in this room today, I, uh, I'm assuming. But my parents did show us, my brother and me, unconditional love. Uh, they did things for us, they, they sacrificed for us, they did things that, as Christians, we do for everybody else in this room, um, as we should, as our Lord does for us. Um, he ra they raised us to be polite, kind, compassionate, um, share the love with others around us. Family things from the weekends, we went to the beach, stock car races, did things, we never went to church. But that all changed in 1970 when my dad passed away unexpectedly of a heart attack while working. And that, as a 15 year old, that put me into a despair of darkness that I never knew before. Um, my mom got very angry at God, said he's, why did he do this? Why did he take her husband away? And my mom was, from the old-fashioned time where well, she, her job was being a housewife, which means stay home, clean house, do laundry, do stuff like that. So she never worked, drove a car, did a checkbook, did anything like that. So I, as a 15-year-old, I was rushed into so my adulthood. I had to get a job and learn how to pay bills and get my mother's appointments and myself. And But um, so... The reason we got in, involved with the church, my aunt played the organ down at the Baptist church by our house, and she asked the pastor if he would do our funeral. He, he begrudgingly said yes. He wasn't, for being a pastor, he wasn't a people person, so I don't know why he was being a pastor, but he, he, he did it just for her because she was 
great organist, and she wanted, so she did. Um, a few months later, their youth pastor came by, and he wanted to check on me, see how I was doing. And I said, I'm, I'm very, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't, you know, my mom's negative. I'm in a negative household. I'm in negative agreement. He said, well, why don't you come to our youth group and check it out? So after a couple of weeks of thinking about it, I did. I went, and then from that on, my life went differently because when I walked in that room, I felt that same unconditional love my parents had for me from the the youth and the youth workers that were there at the time. So that started me thinking, maybe, I, maybe there is something in this world I can grasp onto. So I went on a youth retreat like Aaron does with the kids and takes off with them, goes off and does things, and you hear the word of God, and that's when I became a Christian. It was 19, 1974, I became a Christian. And that day changed my life in a lot of ways, you know. I, I was the only Christian in a household of negative people, so it's sort of hard to keep your little light shining a lot. Um, um, so the reason I'm, the two things I'm thankful for is the people God put in my life. Well, I'm going to name some names, but you only know two of them. But um, Steve Cloud was my youth pastor. He invested, in my, him and his wife and the leaders there invested in my life and made sure I was okay and did things for us. And, Moved into the singles group, but Paul Hubbard was our singles minister and married us, me and Connie, as we got married. Um, then there was, sorry, I'm thinking of these people, how much they impressed my life and helped me through things. And there was Jim Wooten, then there's Wade Roten, and then Russell Lyle and Roger Bunner. These, these men, um, I'm thankful for, because they were the men I was looking for. I didn't have a dad, so I had to think of someone to talk to that had some type of wisdom, some type of godly guidance that I did not have. So that's how, that's mainly I'm thankful for is the godly men God put in my life that I can share and be the man I am today because without these men, I would not be standing here talking to you guys, <laughs> I'll tell you that, <laughs> because it's just the way it is. But um, to get along with everything else, um, then. The Lord blessed me with a beautiful and loving wife who puts up with my craziness and my way of way I do things. I because I I always resort, revert back to negative lifestyle because that's all I knew. I you know, but she keeps me going. She keeps me honest. She keeps me going. And then my daughter does the same thing. And then I thank her for our church family because as I don't know, most of you don't know, but me and my wife don't have any family left. So it just you guys are it. You're stuck with us, so <laughs> it's just the way it's going to be. Um, that's what I'm thankful for is mainly the godly men people put in our, li in our lives, not just me, but in all our lives along the way of our spiritual travel because without that, we wouldn't be where we are today, would we? We would be lost. And <laughs> um, <clears throat> So I'll close with my favorite scripture. It's one I cling to forever. You've heard it many times. No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But when you're in temptation, he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to, to bear it. Just don't remember your circumstances don't define you. Let that be a goal in your life. Let God, let God define your life. You know, don't, don't try to take it in your own hands because you know what that's going to turn out like. <laughs> it's not going to be good. I'm also supposed to give the offertory prayer because that's another thing I'm thankful for. God's provided for us beyond measure of what we could ever think of. You know, we think we now give God, that never happens. You know, he, it doesn't have to be um, money wise or anything, but the blessings He provides for us by putting people like you in our, in our lives, me and Connie's, because you help us so many ways with all the battles we're going through. And you all have the same battles as we do. So we, all stick together. That's what the church is about. And that's why I'm thankful for the men in my life and in this church as well. So let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are in our lives and we can't outgive you. I just pray you take the offerings that we live up today, that they would just honor you and that we'd be reach out to the community, be with our pastor today, give him words to encourage us with this Thanksgiving and Advent season, that we remember the reasons for the season, that you came, you died, and you rose again. So we can have eternal life, which we talked about in Sunday school, the new earth and the new heavens. That, that, that's waiting for us. And I thank you for your love. In your name I pray. Amen.
you, Darlene, because he lives. Amen. All right. Well, I know that you all are probably still in a food coma from Thursday. So wake up. <laughs> and if you have your Bibles, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 21 through 26. Talking about be a disciple who makes a difference. And I hope that all of you want to make a difference in this world. We should want to do that. And oh, let me make sure. All right, lapel is now on. So now, okay. Now we're here, and I don't know. We'll we'll give a moment. Okay, I got a thumbs up. So hopefully those at home are listening. Y'all just need to come to church, and I'll be less stressful with technology. But uh, <laughs> it's good to be in God's house. And as I said, we'll be looking at Acts 11. It is kind of hard to believe, you know, the way the calendar fell this year. You know, I think. I don't know if most of you may be in the same place. You know, I was so thinking, you know, targeting on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving getting there, and you know Christmas is coming, and then you get through Thanksgiving, and it was like a 10, 11 o'clock last night. It dawned on me that, ooh, tomorrow's the first Sunday of Advent. Uh-oh. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I just kind of was thinking, oh, December is Advent. No, the calendar had to throw me and put Advent as the last Sunday in November this year, uh, but it is good to be able to be here, and as we do prepare for the Advent season and uh, for Christmas, I hope that you all are looking forward to a good Christmas and uh, getting past some of the, the difficult challenges that we face this year, but God is in control, amen? He is so in control, and uh, I just love that we started singing some Christmas music, and but also talking about amazing grace, and we're going to be talking about that today too. But God is so faithful, and He has uh, gotten us all through some things. Uh, he's helping me a lot. It's been a, a challenging uh, week for all of us. But uh, as you know, yesterday doing a funeral, trying to give comfort to a, a grieving family with an unexpected loss, and then uh, finding out my aunt went home to be with the Lord and be doing that funeral this week and uh, my dad and uh, family's been out of town they're on the road coming back so a lot of stuff going a lot of moving parts and things happening but we are here to worship the Lord today and I just want to take a moment to encourage you as you prepare uh, and I'll try to make this commercial again at the end you know uh, as this coming Tuesday is the first correct Tuesday yeah anyway I think that's the first, is it? Yeah. So, okay, thank y'all. At least you're paying attention. You're helping keeping me God. Tuesday, I want to challenge you to start reading out of the book of Luke, one chapter a day, and it'll take you up to Christmas Eve. And you will be able, during those 24 days, to hear the story of Jesus before Christmas. So make that an effort this Tuesday to... Uh, Break out your Bible, read one chapter a day. So if you do good, just one equals one, two equals two. You know, you got it, okay? You know, for those of us that miss it, you got to catch, may have to play catch up. But read through the life of Jesus before we celebrate on Christmas Eve. So, uh, and then, of course, in the, this week as we prepare to get the church ready uh, for Christmas, I encourage those of you who would like to help out with uh, bringing a Christmas ornament for our family tree. Uh, you can do that, and we'll have the card boxes up next week. All right, well, anyways, talk about today. We want to be looking at a disciple who makes a, dis, uh, a difference, and the word disciple can sometimes intimidate us. How many of you have actually been officially discipled in a one-on-one -on -one intentional way in your life? Anybody? Not many. Okay. It's a thing I think we as Christians have really dropped the ball on. I wasn't discipled until just a few years ago, one-on-one -on -one with an intentional disciple. Now you can say, well, I've had people who've influenced me, Sunday school teachers or, or youth leaders or pastors, and you got some discipling and someone guided you. But sitting down on a weekly basis, face-to-face, -face, and somebody saying, how you doing? What's this? Where's your Bible study like? Where's your quiet time? Asking the hard questions and teaching you the Bible. I think as Christians, we've 
dropped the ball on that. I had the privilege a few years ago to go through a, a disciple training experience, and it has really helped me and encouraged me. And, but the challenge is, is you're not really a disciple until your disciple makes a disciple. So I got some work to do, <laughs> and we all do, but we're going to look today as we want to be a people who make di a difference, a disciple who makes a difference, and looking at Acts 11, uh, I'm going to go through 21 through 26, and uh, I'm just going to read it first, then we're going to break that down as the Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church of Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived, he saw, the grace of, he saw the grace of God, and he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devout, devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a large number of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarshish to search for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that your words be proclaimed, that you would just through the Holy Spirit speak through me to the people, prepare their hearts and minds to hear from you, not from me, that you would just help us to realize we need to be disciple makers, that we need to make a difference to the people we come in contact with, that we need to grow in our faith, that staying a baby Christian is not what you've called us to be. So, Lord, I pray that you just be with this service today. Let us glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we've seen this whole past month being thankful, and I am thankful, and we uh, through the month I challenged, a, did a lot of uh, gratitude challenges on our Facebook uh, page and asked people to share what they're thankful for, and we had beautiful testimonies, and we need to be thankful. And it's hard, you know, in a year where we could complain a lot, we need to be grateful a lot. We need to make sure we're giving plenty of thanks, and we need to be looking that uh, through that. And I'm hoping that maybe in your life, as Monty shared, you know, there was people who made a difference. They they impacted his life in a spiritual way. And I hope that you can think back and name some names, or at least describe somebody. And we need that. We need people to come alongside, to help us, encourage us. And maybe it was back when you were a young child. Maybe it's been recently. But we need to make sure that we're counting those blessings and having people that are encouraging us in our walk. Because there's enough people trying to tear us down. Sometimes we need somebody we can lean on. And godly Christian people can make a difference in our lives if we get, spend time with them. And the world needs more Christians like that. Amen? We need people that are going to come alongside. And sometimes they have to tell us what we don't want to hear, right? Isn't that the sign of a good friend? A good friend will tell you what you don't want to hear. Because you need to hear it. I've had some friends tell me, they, they, they call me and they'll, they'll say, well, I want your opinion. I go, do you really? Do you really want me to tell you my opinion and what I think you should do? And they're like, yeah. I said, okay. And they, they're like, ouch. But afterwards, they're like, thank you. Because sometimes a good friend is going to say, stop that. Don't do that. Don't go here. Do this. And sometimes it hurts. But you don't need those fake friends that are going to come out, oh, it's okay. It's just, just whatever makes you feel good. It's all right. Just be happy. Just be happy. No, be godly. Do what God wants you to do. And sometimes we need that is to have people encourage us and strengthen us in that walk. And so we see that godly people can make a difference in our life. And we're going to be looking at that. And I think I'm going to just go to the... Pulpit mic. All right. There we go. You good? All right. I just love technology. Oh, Lord Jesus, give me way. grace. We're going to talk about grace. All right. So let's talk about grace. <laughs> My first point talking about it's by grace of God that we can have that. We need to make sure that we see that as Christians like Barnabas in Scripture today, how we can get there, we can be disciples that make a dis difference, and it's by the grace of God. We can make a difference by the amazing grace that Christ gives us, that we can have on that. And uh, we sang about his amazing grace and how our chains are broken. And 
that God's grace helps us. And we see in verses 21 through 23 in our passage today, it says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church, church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the grace of God. And he was glad. So Barnabas saw the grace of God, and we can see that too. We need to look around and see those opportunities where God's grace is there because he is always there. He is in the midst of it. And he uses terrible persecution sometimes to teach us a lesson, to get and spread the good news. And we see that, you know, if the Jerusalem, everything would have been going good there, and there was no persecution. Typical humans, they'd be like, we got a good thing. I ain't gonna, we'll just stay in our little club we'll just build the mega church of jerusalem and you know if people want to hear anything they'll come to us and uh but god had to shake things up and it was like god you ever remember as a kid you ever go out and pick up a dandelion what do you do the little flood and you, you we're not supposed to blow on people in covid okay so and what happened it just all you love to watch all those little seeds go floating away right but if something didn't disturb it, shake it up a little bit, what was going to happen? The seeds wouldn't spread. It's like God blew on the church some persecution, and everyone scattered and spread the gospel. And so we see that a great number of people got saved. Amen. Don't we want to see that again? We want to see great numbers of people get saved, but we can also see God's grace when even one person gets saved. You know, people will say, you know, unfortunately pastors are... Uh, code when you say how's church going what pastors want to know is how many people you're running how's the offering you know it doesn't matter about that god is not going to take an attendance chart when we get to heaven he's not going to ask for our bank records he's going to say how many souls were turned their lives to jesus that's what matters and whether god lets one person get saved in this church or five thousand people get saved in this church we're here to spread the gospel and keep going and god will take care of the results you know you can say well it's discouraging we work so hard and we keep past you keep preaching the word but nobody's walking the aisle nobody's joining the church we don't see the church growing we have no idea what the holy spirit's doing in the lives of others you know i think about the few weeks back we did trunk or treat drive through we have no idea those people who drove through here they got a gospel track and a DVD. We say, well, where are they? Why aren't they in our church? How do you know what church they're in? Those little kids could have taken that track home and read the gospel and prayed to accept Christ in the privacy of their own home, but they can't drive, so of course they're not in church. Or maybe their parents watched it and said, well, you know, let's go to church X, Y, or Z. Our job is to keep sharing the gospel and sharing the gospel and telling people, let God take care of the results. Some of us plant, some of us water, and sometimes we get to see the harvest. But you know what? We all get to see the harvest in heaven. What's going to be so great is when we get there one day, we're going to have people walk up to us, you know, thank you, thank you. It's because of you, I'm here in heaven. You're going to be like, what? I never talked to you. Uh, your church gave out a gospel tract. Your church prayed for me. I was on a prayer list, and I came to know Christ. And, or, you know, your church gave money to missions. Or your church sent Operation Christmas Child boxes, and I got the gospel. We have no idea what we're doing today and how it's going to affect people. And we can go on and on about that. But we see that, you know, as God sometimes shakes up the church a little bit, but it's through grace of God. And Paul told the church in Ephesians, it is for you are saved by grace through faith that it is not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not from works so that no one can boast. If we could earn it, if we could do something for it, we'd go around bragging about, look what I did. It's by grace. It's by God's grace. You know, uh, there was a pastor who defined God's grace. It says, his grace, his good will to us, this is how he defined God's grace, his merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls turns them to Christ, keeps them, strengthens them, increases them in the Christian faith, knowledge, and affection, and kindles them to exercise their Christian virtues. You know, but really when we think about grace, I think about the, the letters of grace, 
G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ paid the price for you to get the abundance of grace that we have. It's by the grace of God Jesus died on the cross for punishment of our sins. And I've said that in the past few funerals I've done, that we're all going to go live in eternity. Do you know your address? Do you know for sure where you're going to be? It's by the grace of God that we can have an eternity with Jesus. But we also see how God's grace takes care of us and challenges through life. And it's through the cross that we're saved. But I learned a little story. Most of you may have heard of James Kennedy, you know, or Dr. Kennedy. You may have seen him on TV or seen his books. Well, I didn't, I've known of him, didn't know a lot about him. And I came across this story of his life, and I wanted to share that with you. It says, James Kennedy certainly knew about the grace of God. Dr. Kennedy was one of the greatest pastors in our day, and he started the evangelism explosion. I remember going through evangelism explosion training. Some of you may have done that, too. And he helped many people come to Christ over the years. But uh, Dr. Kennedy also took a very strong stand for family values. And, oh, so we need that today. But back in the 1950s, uh, James Kennedy was, <laughs> get this, an instructor at an Arthur Murray dance studio. Never would have thought thought that but here he was he is also uh was a led a very drunken and immoral lifestyle and but he came across this christian girl and they started dating and she asked him where do you go to church and he replied nowhere you don't have to go to church to be a good person then with an air of arrogance he said you can be a good you can be a good christian without going to church and this girl wisely looked him at the, in the eyes and said, no, you can't. Sometimes you need that friend to tell you what you need to hear. Christian, you need to be in church. That's what God's called us to be. And so years later, Dr. Kennedy said it was, that was the first time anyone had ever challenged his little saying that he would come back at. And he was taken back and it made him rethink everything. A week later, Kennedy was asleep in a drunken haze, and when he woke up, he heard a preacher on the radio. People are like, what's a radio? No. <laughs> he got up to turn it off, but before he could get to the radio, he heard this pastor ask this question. Suppose that you were to die today and stand before God, and he was asked you, what right do you have to enter my heaven, and what would you say? Dr. Kennedy was stopped in his tracks. He didn't know what to do. And he sat back and he began to listen to the whole sermon as his pastor shared the gospel. And right there, Dr. James Kennedy accepted Christ, asked for forgiveness. And the next day as he's shaving, he tells the story. He's looking himself in the mirror. And as he's saying, he goes, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. And he realized that he's going to spend eternity with his Savior. He was so happy and grateful, and so he said, I said to himself, I want this to happen, what happened to me to happen to as many people as possible. And so he started going to church with his new Christian girlfriend, and for over 50 years showed his appreciation for Jesus by loving and serving and making disciples and telling people. You know, looking back, we can see the work, grace of God working in uh, his life, and we can see that bold statement of truth but from the girlfriend, God's grace is there. God's grace is calling out to you. He loves you. Jesus died for you. So we're going to be looking at the Advent season, the coming birth of the Savior. He came to die. He came to die. Think about that. His grace is there. Uh, my next point, number two, says, How can we be disciples who make a difference? by the grace of God, as I said, and by firmly gripping the Lord. That's what Barnabas urged the believers to do in Antioch. Keep holding on to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here, you know, Barnabas' name was also, his nickname was a son of encouragement. He was known for being encouraging, and he went out and helped. And it's an extremely important for us to notice how he encouraged Christians. If you see in verses 23 and 24, it says, When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. Devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a large number of people were added to the Lord. 
Barnabas encouraged those Christians to remain true, to remain devoted. King James says uh, the, to cleave unto the Lord. NIV says he encouraged them to remain true with their hearts. The Amplified Bible says he continuously exhorted, warned, urged, and encouraged them all to cleave unto the remain faithful to and devoted to the Lord, resolute and steady, purpose of heart. Amplified Bible is very long, so... <laughs> But it gets the point, tells you that he was telling them to do all they could. He encouraged them. He was intentional and persistent about holding people accountable and telling them to hold on to the Lord. Trying to encourage them to walk closer than they were, to hold strong when they're going through things. This holding fast, Lord, is necessary as long as we're in this world. This year, maybe you've been holding on tighter, and that's a good thing. What I heard a lot this week. I listen to the Joy FM almost all the time when I'm driving around and this past week they were talking about Thanksgiving and everything and what we're thankful for and what did 2020 teach you that you could be thankful for? And it was amazing to hear people over and over again talk about while it was difficult they got closer to their families this year they got closer to their savior this year they read the Bible more this year. They prayed more. They got to know neighbors. They got to do things that if in the regular things wouldn't have held on to. But they got to be growing in the Lord and holding fast and they held on stronger. It's because it's difficult. You know, when we're born, uh, born again, the old nature doesn't necessarily die off. It comes up and calls out to us. The Bible calls it the flesh of the old man. And in Romans 6, our old man was, says it was crucified with Christ, but it doesn't always seem to get the message. So when we see Paul struggling in Romans 7, and sometimes we see ourselves, listen to Romans 7. If you ever go on through and say, well, why do I keep going back to the old ways? You know, why can't we just get saved and never have another problem? Wouldn't y'all like that? Doesn't work that way. Listen to what happened to Paul. If Paul struggled, if Paul struggled, we're all going to face some struggles. In Romans 7, 15 through 24, it says, For I do not understand what I am doing. You ever ask that? <laughs> because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Paul's been watching me. Now if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is within me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discovered this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present within me. For in my inner self I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man am I! Who will rescue me from this body of death? What's great is we get to see an answer here. We see it continues on. The answer is Jesus. So this last two verses of Romans 7, it goes on to say, What a wretched man am I in verse 24. Who will rescue me from this body of death? In 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself am serving the law, but with my flesh, the law of sin. Barnabas knew the key to a strong Christian life was getting close to Jesus as he could. Spending time with the Lord. And that's, if you're struggling, that's what you need to do. Spend time with Jesus. Spend time in his word. Get devoted to him. Hold on tight. And we saw this, you know, Barnabas saw the grace of God was working in the life and he was good. But he also realized people needed to know more. How did Barnabas get so full of the Holy Spirit? where it talks about he was full of the Holy Spirit and faith because he was taking a daily walk with the Lord. Daily taking him, spending time with him. He had already seen, uh, he has been ready to take this great advice. He gave it to the Christians in Antioch to remain true in the Lord with devoted hearts. The navigators 
It was a great group that helped disciple me. Back in an informal prayer meeting, back in the White House in the 1970s, they were invited into the White House and some high-powered leaders gathered for inspiration, encouragement, and the opportunity to pray together. Somewhat surprisingly, a gentleman named Arthur Burns began attending, and he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve System at the time, and he was Jewish. So those who typically led the prayer time wouldn't call on him to close in prayer because they weren't sure about him attending their Bible study. But one week, a new Comer came to the lead the prayer meeting, and before thinking about it, he asked Mr. Burns to lead in the closing prayer. And some of the regulars glanced at each other and wondered, what's going to happen? What's he going to do? What's he going to say? But Mr. Burns immediately reached out to join hands with those around and began what has become one of the most memorable prayers in that type of meeting. Arthur Burns said, Lord, I pray that you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. I pray that you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. And finally, Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. Everybody needs Jesus. All people need Jesus. Everybody needs to know Jesus as Savior, and every believer needs to know him more and more, getting a good grip on him. When you're going through tough times, reach out. Hang on to Jesus. My third point, talking about we can be disciples who make a difference by firmly gripping with the Lord and by going where he leads. All these wonderful things happened starting in verse 22 because Barnabas was willing to go. In verse 22, he's willing to go as far as Antioch and he's willing to go as far as the Lord wanted him to do. And he's told to go out and find and search for Saul and, and find him and he spent a whole year with him. But we see here he had to go to Tarshish which, to encourage Paul to help come help in Antioch. And now, depending on which way he traveled, it could be about 100 miles by sea or 150 miles by land. And beyond this great distance, could you imagine trying to find somebody at that time? Have you ever been to a theme park or out shopping recently and you're trying to find your party? What do we do? We either text, where are you, or call. You imagine back then traveling 150 miles to a town, you don't know anybody, and trying to find one guy? You don't even know what he may look like. Just walk around, hello, hey, anybody seen Saul? Anybody know where Saul's at? I don't look for Saul. You know, he's the guy that kills Christians. You know, I'm trying to find him. You know, how do you think that's going over? You know, but here he is, he goes out and he finds him, and he's... <laughs> You also remember he's being sent to find the guy who was persecuting and killing Christians. Now he's going there to disciple him and work with him. And even after Paul got saved, you know, the church wasn't too eager to accept him. And I don't think it'd be much different today. Unfortunately, Christians, we have a bad reputation of shooting our wounded. The church should be a hospital for sinners, not a hotel for saints. We need to reach out to people who need Jesus and are hurting, even if their reputation may be what we don't think. Here, Barnabas reached out and knew that God was still going to work in Paul's life, and by the grace of God, he saw that change in his life. And so even back in Acts 9, Barnabas vouched for Paul before the church of Jerusalem, and now he's encouraging Paul to come and help in Antioch. Think of that wonderful difference we see even today because Barnabas was willing to go where God called him. We must be willing to go where God calls us, to do what we need to do. It may be going across the street to help a neighbor. It may be picking up the phone and calling somebody that hasn't been in church in a while and asking how they are. It may be reaching out to that family member that you had a fight with decades ago, can't remember why you're fighting, but you're still holding on to a grudge. We need to realize that we need to be reaching out we're on a mission. We need to be telling people about Jesus. And point four says we need to be, make a difference. We go where the Lord leads and we gather together with other Christians. What a difference this makes. In verse 26, we see he found them and the whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. Many people got saved. We need to spend time gathering together whether it be through Bible study or worship service, coming together, and that's what we need to be doing. Great things happen when God's people get together. 
We draw strength and encouragement. We cry together. We laugh together. We lift up one another. We pray for one another. One of my favorite verses that I challenge people with all the time is Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. It says, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Do you believe God is faithful? Do you believe it? Hold on to that. And it says in verse 24, Let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day approaching. Church, I think the day is approaching. I think it's coming. I don't know how soon, but I know it's coming. And we're told in Scripture not to neglect the gathering it together as some are in the habit, all the more as you see the day coming. Now is not the time to hide in a bubble. Now is not the time to sit there and not talk to people about Jesus. The world is telling us, don't gather, don't worship, don't pray, don't sing. Do your thing but by yourself. God told us to gather together and to worship and to tell people and invite people and encourage one another all the more. We need to make a difference in this world. We need to be telling people it's time to get back in church. Be safe about it, but be back in church. If you look around here, everyone's social distance. They're safe. But there's still some empty pews where more people could fit in here, social distancing. If it gets to the point where we start getting a little too crowded in here, guess what? We'll do two services and spread out. We need to keep back in church. We need to worship. We need to sing. We need to pray together, encourage one another. Wear our mask. We take your hand sanitizer, sit apart. But we're here to worship the Lord. And I fear that part where it says some are in the habit of doing, some are getting too comfortable sitting at home. And yes, I probably just offended a bunch of you sitting at home right now. But sometimes you have to be told what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And this pastor says you need to be in church. Don't live in fear. If you have a health issue and you need to stay home, stay home. But a lot of you don't have health issues because you're going out to dinner, you're going to the restaurants, you're going to work every day, but you don't come to church. And this pastor's frustrated because we need to be doing what God's called us to do. Don't live in fear. Now you can say, oh, he's yelling at me because my doctor says to stay home. Then stay home. But some of you are staying home because it's just convenient. Jesus could have said, it's not convenient to carry the cross. I thank God he did. We need to get back to making a difference. I'm getting riled up because I think the day is coming soon. And this pastor wants to be able to stand in heaven and say, yeah, I did all I could, Lord. I told them. I told them. They just didn't listen. We need to share the gospel. We need to be making disciples. We need to be worshiping. We need to not walk in fear, walk in faith. Be safe. But could you realize there's going to be people who are going to go to hell because we were too afraid to talk to them because we didn't want to get within six feet of them. Some of these people are standing inside the gates of hell and we're too afraid to say, come this way. We need to get busy. God's grace is there. If God decides to take me home from an illness, I'm going home. If God decides to take me to go home by a car accident, I'm going home. If God takes me out in any other way, I'm going home. I'm kingdom bound. And that's what I need to realize. And we all need to be cautious, take safety measures, but don't be afraid to tell people about Jesus. Let's get busy doing the gospel. We need to realize God's amazing grace. 
Hold on tight to him. Go where he leads. If he says it's time to talk to your friends about Jesus, then get up and talk to them. And gather together. Gather together. There's room in here for more. If we have to go to double services, I'm okay with that. If we have to go to triple services because we can only fit so many in at a time, I'm okay with that. But let's not not come. Let's worship the Lord. May we do these things and grow because we need the Lord. Don't y'all need him? More now than ever, we need the Lord. Let us pray. Would you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, I need you. Lord, I do. Lord, we all need you, and we thank you for your saving grace. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your watch care. We thank you as this Thanksgiving season is as difficult as this year has been. We can be thankful. But Lord, as we enter now into an Advent season and think of your son coming, I also think of his coming again. Heavenly Father, I don't know when you're going to send him, but I know you're going to send him soon. And we need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to walk by faith, not fear. We need to tell people to get in church. But more than just attend church, we need to tell them the Savior saved them. Or can save them if they'll just accept Jesus. Attending church is not going to impress you until you change our hearts. So Lord, I pray you just work on those that need salvation. Or that you would help those that need assurance, that need encouragement. There's probably people today that are depressed, suffering anxiety, hurt. Help them to realize they need you. We need you, Lord. Bless this time of decision. The altar is open for those that need to pray. Maybe you're praying right there, and if you're home watching, I pray for you. I love you. I'm not mad at you, but I love you enough to say, do what God needs you to be doing. Don't live in fear. Lord, use this time of decision, whether it be online or here in this place. Help us to realize how much we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Before we sign off, I'm going to have Daddy to be. Aaron closes in prayer, dismisses, but just real quick, commercial wise, sorry. Uh, because of we're wanting to make sure we have a very safe environment, our church is going through a lot of Lysol. So if you're able to find some on the shelves and donate a spray can, we'd love that. Um, but we are disinfecting our building every time before every service. So, but it's getting harder to find again. So if you have one of those people that hoarded up a can or two, you know, let us have one. Um, but uh, also don't forget next week we'll have the Christmas card box, a time that you can encourage one another through cards. We'll have the family ornaments. And next Sunday, I'm also real excited that we're going to have the Lord's Supper. Great way to kind of wind down this year, partake in the Lord's Supper, and uh, kind of get more in ready for the Advent season. So a lot of great things. Uh, Daddy to be, why don't you close us out? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much just for uh, what you have done in our lives. God, we thank you so much for the blessings that you bestow upon us every day. We, Father, we thank you that uh, we just are able to meet in a place where we can worship. God, we are able to uh, just practice the right that we have to worship you. God, we are allowed to do so in such a way that uh, we have not been are restricted by the government. We haven't had anybody tell us how or what we can do, but God, we've gotten to a point where we can still worship you uh, the way that you have called us to. I pray that you would just allow us to be able to meet here. God, I pray that this next week we will see somebody come out that we haven't seen recently and just be able to be in your house and enjoy fellowship with one another. Father, I pray that you will just surround us with protection. God, those who are uh, uh, just struggling, I pray that you will surround them with love and support from other believers around them, from yourself, God. I pray that your mighty hand will just come down and do a work here with us. Father, we just pray that we will cling to you always because we need you every day, Father. Uh, be, be with us as we go. God, keep us safe, and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.